have to cry. All right, uh, good morning, it's nine. We will try to start on time and we will try to finish more or less on time. That's uh, Jacopo asked me to respect the time schedule today. I'm a very disciplined guy, so we'll try. Uh, of course, you still are uh, encouraged to ask questions during the presentation. That's, uh, of course, uh, unavoidable. But uh, still, we will try not to bother too much the speaker so that he can finish his talk on time. All right? So, Jay, you're welcome. Okay, uh, bonjour. Uh, we have some important uh, issues to resolve based on our discussion uh, from yesterday. Um, probably the most important thing we talked about was this philosophical discussion of, of whether or not uh, sleep was, a, was <laughs> fit the operational definition of dormancy, which you may recall is the ability of an individual to enter a reversible state of reduced metabolic activity. Um, I, I walked away feeling I didn't have a satisfactory answer for you, so I, I went and did a little bit of research uh, to find out what, what, what people in the field tend to think. Uh, and so first, I, I'll just briefly say that there are some people who think that, uh, that sleep is not a form of dormancy um, for, for a couple of reasons. There's, some, uh, there, there's cognitive and informational processing going on. There's consolidation of, of memories. Um, and also, you know, we're using the example of, of, of a parent who can instantaneously wake up when they hear a baby crying in their room. So, so it's not really a, um, a deep, completely restful state. Um, and uh, so the ability to respond quickly is one of the major arguments there. Um, but I still think that kind of uh, fits the definition of dormancy in some ways. And uh, I was able to find this one opinion paper in Nature Reviews Neuroscience that talks about the, the sleep viewed as a state of ina adaptive inactivity. And I just highlighted this one phrase here that uh, sleep could be best understood as a variant of dormant states even uh, throughout the plant and animal kingdoms. And that is uh, highly adaptive because it optimizes timing and the duration of behavior. So we could argue about the mechanisms and the, uh, the purpose of sleep, but at least at some level, I, have, I hope I've provided some closure to this issue, <laughs> whether or not, uh, after 20 minutes of conversation, so I think we can say that sleep maybe uh, fits some definitions of dormancy. Um, I ended yesterday uh, rather rapidly trying to present that there's a bit of a conundrum, at least with some forms of, of dormancy. And I was specifically referring to endosporulation in groups of bacteria like Bacillus and the Clostridia. Uh, these, these organisms undergo this complicated pathway of transforming into uh, a protein-rich, highly inert uh, cell. They're very abundant in, in the natural environment, uh, estimated somewhere on the you know, order of 10 to the power of 28, just in marine sediments alone. Um, but it struck us that this was a very energetically expensive and time-consuming uh, process to engage in, uh, which the conundrum is, if, you're, if a cell is a responsive form of dormancy, so you remember this is when uh, an organism detects changes in its environment, could be resources or other environmental conditions, it senses these conditions, and undergoes some responsive change to enter a quiescent or dormant state. Uh, endosporulation fits that bill, but it requires a lot of energy. And I went through some calculations very quickly to show you how many ATPs that cost and how that compares rather to other cellular processes. So it is expensive. So um, why would a starving cell choose to do something uh, that seems to be so expensive? And we've kind of walked through some examples in our group about uh, bed hedging mechanisms. Not all cells do this. Some mother cells invest more in offspring, uh, endospore offspring than others. Um, there, there's a, a time scale at which we can start to think about this, where there's a break-even point, where um, other survival strategies that don't involve endosporulation uh, need to be paid, and those payments accrue instantaneously over time, where sporulation is a one-time investment. So these are some potential explanations that could lead to the maintenance of uh, endosporulation, even though in many cases uh, over 
um, the course of geologic timescales, this trait has been evolutionarily lost. Um, so what I want to uh, propose today is a segue, a different way of thinking about this problem, and in, in, that instead of just protecting from environmental stresses or energy, energetic limitations, uh, that sporulation may um, provide some additional benefits. And we're going to view this through uh, the lens of species interactions. Okay? So can species interactions modify the benefits of investing in what otherwise seems to be an energetically costly decision process? Oh, and so uh, this figure that I have up here depicts this. So yesterday we, we focused entirely on this dormancy module and the transitions. And what I have on the left is kind of a classical food web module, uh, which describes host parasite interactions. Uh, there's resources that are being consumed by the host. The host is the, the, the focal uh, group of organisms that can engage in dormancy. And there's either a predator or a parasite that can be feeding on those organisms. And so um, as we described yesterday, this is a form of phenotypic switching where there could be preference for one type over another. Uh, and we're interested, uh, I'm interested in to what degree that influences uh, the process of, of coevolutionary change between two species. I'm not going to go into depth. I showed this really quickly. I've just described it. We're going to focus today exclusively on one group of microorganisms. Uh, these, these fall in this group, this phylum of bacteria called the Bacillota. Uh, they exhibit the responsive resuscitation under good conditions. They're dividing uh, rapidly every 20 minutes, typically under uh, good conditions. Uh, but when they sense uh, specifically amino acid uh, alanine limitation, uh, this serves as a cue that uh, changes a lot of uh, gene expression in the mother cell. It leads to development of a septum, uh, which will create a, a new force spore. There's uh, a genome replication. There's a translocation of that genome into the force spore. The, the baby, the force spore, consumes the mother, and we're left with this uh, highly resilient uh, endospore. So how does uh, a phage that has the capacity to affect a genotype uh, how is it affected by the ability of an individual to, to sporulate? So we'll start first with a, the simple scenario where we can imagine that Bacillus is not undergoing sporulation. Uh, and we can imagine a classic uh, lytic reproductive cycle, for to be simple here. Um, so there are, sorry. There's no laser pointer on this, though. So. Okay. So over here, we have a susceptible active vegetative cell. And there are phage particles in the environment that are moving around randomly via Brownian motion. Uh, contact is made. And if that phage particle combined to the receptors on the surface of that active cell, it will inject its DNA. The DNA um, uh, takes over the cellular machinery of the host cell, makes new virus particles that assemble. Uh, they produce enzymes that will burst the cell, and the viral progeny will be released back into the environment. Okay, so this is a basic um, bacteriophage lytic life cycle, if you will. So we can imagine that happening. Um, but when we think about what happens when that same virus interacts with an endospore, uh, the dynamics are very different. So we're showing you some data right here that we collected from what's called an adsorption assay. And the way you do an adsorption assay is you take a suspension of susceptible cells and you expose them to virus particles. Uh, and then over time, you measure the fraction or concentration of free virus particles over time. Okay, so what you can see in the blue line is the adsorption dynamics when phage particles are interacting with an active cell. And you can see that they're decreasing exponentially over time. You can measure that uh, decay rate, and that, that's, your, that's the actual adsorption rate uh, constant that you would include, for example, in a model. Um, and so what we did is the same experiment, simple experiment, with concentrated and purified endospores. And you can see that the concentrations of free particles that we added at the beginning of the experiment stay constant over time. There's no decrease. That means that the, the, that the viruses, which are capable of infecting that genotype, cannot bind to the surface and start and initiate the first step of the infection process. So this is a physiological form of resistance to those virus, uh, virus particles. We refer to this as a, a refuge, right? The, the viruses can't get inside the host.
There's another aspect of this that I'm not going to talk about too much today, but I think is really fascinating, and I would love to. Um, I want, I'm actively trying to work on this, but there's some methodological problems. Some work from the 1970s and 80s where people have documented that phages, they're the phage genomes, can actually get inside of endospores. And the way in which they do this is truly amazing. So um, a vi the process of, of sporulation takes a long time, eight hours. So during that time, a virus can get inside an actively growing cell as the process of dormancy and sporulation begins. Um, many of these viruses contain what are called OA boxes that will bind to uh, a sporulation, uh, a master regulatory gene, SPO0A. And that halts the infection process. So viral infection cannot proceed if a virus contains one of these auxiliary genes. So, so lytic reproduction is halted. Um, then, as dormancy proceeds, there's this genome duplication of the mother, and it needs to be translocated and transported into the endospore. The virus has stolen another type of gene, a PAR gene, which is actually physically anchoring the genome and moving it into the endospore. So it seems that there are uh, genetic components within some viral genomes that allow viruses to actually be physically moved into an endospore. And you can imagine that if the environment is not suitable for reproduction for the host, it may, is also not suitable for the reproduction and, and reproductive fitness of a virus. Um, but it would be uh, advantageous for the virus a genome to be incorporated into an endospore where it would uh, benefit from the protection from the environment. Importantly, uh, it, it's not incorporated into the host genome. Uh, it, it just rests with inside the, the endospore. And this is something that fits a definition uh, known as pseudo-lysogeny. Okay. So what fraction of the 10 to the power 28 endospores um, in marine sediments uh, and other ecosystems um, have contain what are called virospores through this process of entrapment? I don't have any answers to that question, but um, there, there's some problems in trying to study it, but I find it really um, interesting. Yeah. Just to clarify, the virus spore will contain both the virus and the, and the, and the bacterial genomes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the, without the bacteria, it will not be able to exit at any gate. It cannot exit, but upon germination, presumably, and this is, this is true, it has been documented, that upon germination of the host, the virus can resume its uh, 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 lytic reproductive Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, so we talked a little bit about this at lunch. So um, let's imagine we're talking about this situation. The cell wakes up, and then immediately the virus starts its reproductive cycle, lyses the cell, and maybe there's not a lot of other hosts. Uh, there, there can be stochastic components of germination. So you would want to wake up, if you're a virus, uh, you would want your host to wake up in, where there are other hosts in the environment that you could subsequently infect. So if that's not the case for some reason, then uh, incorporating and replicating with the genome via lysogeny and prophage would, would be perhaps a better strategy. I don't know if I articulate, we talked about this at lunch briefly. I'm not sure if that's really clearly communicated, but yeah, it might depend on the environment and the, the abundance of susceptible hosts there. Uh, anyway, this is sort of, for me, when I learned about this, my mind was kind of blown. People do this for just as a, as a practical purpose in their laboratory for how, you, if, you're, if you're into bacillus and you're into bacillus phages, people actually store their phages in endospores because it's a more stable way of maintaining cultures in your laboratory, which I think is just wild. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, no one has ever documented this phenomena in the wild, and there's a few studies from the 70s and 80s, um, and a little bit more genomic work from roughly 2005. So I find this really curious, uh, um, but I don't have much more to say about it. Um, how is the detection? No one, no one has done any genomics on this. So, so there's a feature that I, um, this is a good time to, to talk about this. These endospores are um, heat resistant. And so experimentally in the laboratory, you can heat treat a sample and, and by doing so, kill all the vegetative or active cells and you're left with a purified population of spores. Um, and then if you polite those spores on media, they'll germinate. And if you do that, then you can see that phage particles will emerge and you get plaques. And so those plaques, the viruses are also heat sensitive. So the only way you could get a virus particle um, would be if they, they came 
from inside the endospore. Okay. So these are the ways in which uh, sporulation might modify uh, interactions between bacteria and viruses. Um, some work I want to talk about now, there, there's maybe three things that we could get through today, and this is number one. Um, we wanted to ask a question about how sporulation modifies the directional um, evolutionary process between a, a virus population and a bacterial population. Um, we used a virus in the lower left, it's SPO01, this is a caudo virales, it's a tailed phage, it belongs to a family called the Heloviridae. It's very similar to a T4-like phage. And we used uh, uh, Bacillus subtilis um, on the right. These organisms, as I've described, show endospores. This is a phase contrast image. You can very conveniently and, and beautifully see uh, the white uh, uh, phase uh, uh, particles that light does not transmit through because of the dense packing of materials in there, um, along with some of the other vegetative cells. Um, so we can study these microscopically. We can study them in a cultivation-based uh, approach using this heat treatment. Um, it's a really good uh, genetic model system. I'm going to talk about one of the genetic modifications that we made of a sporulation or a dormancy trait. And then we use a, uh, an experimental modification of an experimental evolution approach. I assume many of you are probably familiar with these types of experiments, but they're pretty, um, pretty straightforward. Uh, you have replicate populations. Um, and you, you track individual uh, populations or flasks over time, doing, in our case, serial transfers. So we take 1% uh, volume and transfer it every day into new media. And we just, uh, population densities are, are, are fairly large in this case, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8. So we have large effective population size, which tend to favor um, selection for, for adaptive mutations when rare. Um, so that, this is a general approach. Um, and we have two treatments with, with regard to the seed bank. The first is really simple. So um, we uh, performed a genetic deletion of, a, of an essential gene called SPO2E, which is required for the successful production of an endospore. So we just deleted that gene, and now we have bacillus mutant that cannot form sporulation. And therefore, uh, dormant individuals cannot accumulate, and that's how we're defining a, as the seed bank, correct? Okay. So that's one treatment. And then, um, you know, we passage these over time. After generation one, we introduce the viruses and we're able to track the, uh, the population dynamics, phenotypic diversity, and molecular evolutionary dynamics over time. And this treatment, and we're going to contrast this with a treatment that has a seed bank. Um, this figure looks a little bit complicated. Um, maybe it is, but I, I think I can explain it to you. The first thing in this case is we don't use that sporulation mutant. We're using the wild type, a strain that can form an endospore. Um, and again, that endospore confers uh, resistance, phenotypic resistance to virus particles because it can't attach, right? So that's one way in which we can contrast things. But what we noticed is that if you take, like a chemostat, we were just talking about this before, if you take uh, a population that has uh, spores in it and you transfer it into fresh media, what happens? It wakes up. It wakes up. So quickly your seed bank from the previous time step just erodes. Like, Everything wakes up. So you have no way of, of having a, a, a biological memory of, of organisms from the past from dormant individuals because they just it erodes and they wake up from the previous time step. Uh, embarrassing that took us a little bit of time to, to figure out. And so what we, what we envisioned was, um, and this is actually biologically, I think, reasonable, is that there is an external seed bank. Um, out here in the Mediterranean Sea, there are organisms that are metabolically active that are in the pelagic, the upper uh, suspended parts of the ocean. There are a lot of dormant organisms that are living in the sediments below that get recruited from time due to changes in temperature and nutrient concentrations. So the seed bank uh, here in the Mediterranean is physically separated in some way from uh, many of the active organisms that live within the water column. So we did something analogous to that. We, we created an external seed bank. And what that meant is that uh, at every time step, we took some of these dense cells, we heat treated them, killed off all the vegetative cells, and we have this uh, falcon tube of, of endospores, uh, purified endospores, from time point um, t minus 1. And then we would keep this separately, and then we would add back some of those at each time step. But this whole external seed bank is a, is a moving window of time. 
and we transferred, uh, we, we wanted a, st a relatively strong seed bank effect, so we, it was a four to one ratio of new endospores to old endospores. You could imagine doing an experiment where you change the ratio of, of individuals from previous time steps. So there's an there's a, there's a introduction of new endospores from this collective external pool at each time step in the experiment. <laughs> so, uh, so the heat treatment is to kill everything that is alive. All the active cells. All the active cells, so because in, and does the heat treatment also um, induce pyrrolation in some of the new cells? No. We assume not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I also have a question. So. What causes the sporulation in the end of the cycle? It runs out of alanine, as you described? Or? Yeah, a good question. So we, I think we were transferring these um, every day. And during that time, you, you get, uh, there's enough time there for uh, resources. We used a DSM medium to exhaust resources and induce sporulation, yeah. And I have some numbers somewhere on like what fraction of the population uh, in this treatment were, were forming endospores. So in the end of the cycle, there is a mixture of the cells which just stop growing because they run out of resources and spores, right? Am I... I think that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And what, is the, what makes alanine special? Uh, why choose uh, alanine and not some other amino acid? Um, God knows. Um, I, I don't know why alanine is so important. The media we use here wasn't, necess it wasn't defined. Uh, there's a medium you can order called uh, DSM sporulation media, which compared to LB, uh, foster sporulation more in these, in these populations of bacteria. But I don't know exactly what's in. There, there's, a, there's certain uh, elements like uh, calcium, potassium, things like this that are important for making the endospore. Uh, but it's not, it's not defined media. So we don't know for sure if it's alanine limitation. But th there's some general resource limitation in this environment that's inducing sporulation. Um, I'm not sure I understood the parallel with the um, uh, seed banks in the sitting in the sediments of the ocean and sort of like how do they get up, how do they wake up. I mean, it's not clear to me at all that they're able to cross this whatever minimum 100 meters of water and sort of like. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think um, yesterday I showed this one figure where there were, were proportion of inactive uh, cells in different types of ecosystems. So you could go into the surface water here, I'm positive, and you would find, especially right now this time of year, that there would be some bacteria, uh, diatoms, phytoplankton, what have you, that are metabolically inactive. So it's not true that these, these pools are always distinct, but there's definitely a reservoir um, uh, of, of inactive dormant organisms that reside in, in sediments. Uh, and in many other cases, the plants are another good example, right? Like if we go out and we look at the vegetation that's growing out of the ground, those individuals are going to be largely metabolically active, and the seeds that are produced at the end of a growing seed get deposited in the soil. So it's not, it's not specific to, to uh, limnetic ecosystems. It, it, in many cases, the uh, spores and seed bank is physically separated from actively growing individuals. Now, to ask your question, I, I mean, I think there are things, like if you're in the bottom of the ocean and you're asking what, what triggers, uh, could be thermal activity, depending on how deep the water column is, uh, penetration of solar radiation could be a cue. Uh, I don't know a lot about what, what uh, leads to cyst uh, resuscitation in, in, in marine sediments, for example. Just wanted to add a comment on this. I'm no ocean, oceanographer or anything, but it's known that there are, depending on weather and stuff like that, there can be like slow upwelling currents yeah. that basically go but on, uh, yeah. on, on the bottom of the yeah. sea and then basically yeah, yeah. like mix yeah. everything very slowly and bring stuff from the bottom of the sea Great. to the surface layer. So migration of dormant individuals, right, through passive mechanisms. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Last question now. More of as a comment than anything else, but I'm probably going to confuse people. So uh, part of the population will also sporulate even when no starvation is present as a yeah. form of a bed hedging with quorum sensing. Are you using the 168 laboratory or some kind of undomesticated strain for uh, Bacillus subtilis in this experiment? 
Um, so, right, remember there's two flavors or categories of transitioning. There's, there's responsive um, uh, transitions into and out of dormancy, and there's stochastic forms of which can, would not be dependent on things like resource limitation. Bacillus subtilis and sporulation, in th this case, it seems, the evidence seems to be um, largely that this is an example of responsive transitioning where organisms mm -hmm. are able to sense changes in, in resource availability, but there have been uh, documentations of stochastic processes. I know I measured it. Yeah, good. So, so we're going to assume that this is mostly, uh, to answer your second question, we're using uh, delta uh, uh, 168. So this is a, a somewhat minimized cell of Bacillus subtilis that uh, we've removed things like prophages, which would potentially be important for this, uh, um, this system and the questions that we're asking. Um, so, so we just tracked these, you know, this is just a, a plot showing the population dynamics of the bacteria and the viruses over time. Uh, remember, we have the, the seed bank uh, treatment in place here. So in this panel, we've genetically removed the capacity of this organism to form endospores. Prediction would be that the cells there would all be uh, expressing receptors, at least in the beginning of the experiment, uh, that would make them um, in infected by, infectable by, by virus particles, right? Um, so no, no dormancy refuge here. And in these populations, they can form endospores, but we also have this additional feature, which is the external seed bank. And so statistically, and even by eye, you can see that these dynamics are somewhat different. There's a major uh, drop in host densities, bacterial densities early on in the experiment, reaching a minimum population size of 10 to the 6 at about 6 days. You can see that this, um, the, the, the minimum population densities uh, with the seed bank is extended to much longer. The population dynamics on average are more stable with the seed bank than they are in the absence of that. Um, another thing we did, this figure is, um, looks simple, and it, uh, but, but I could imagine somebody getting a little bit confused. We are interested in the retention of phenotypic diversity in the population. And what do we mean by phenotypic diversity? Uh, when you challenge uh, a bacterial population against a virus, it rapidly evolves resistance. In this case, probably through a modification of a teochoic acid receptor on the cell's surface. And once that cellular modification has been made, the virus particles typically can no longer attach. And this is the mechanism by which uh, a bacterium evolves resistance to a phage, in this case. Okay. So uh, in the minus C bank treatment, you can see that we're starting the, the, an experiment at time zero where 100% of all the individuals are very close to 100% of all the individuals. We, we sampled clones, like 20 clones from this population, and 100% of them were sensitive to the ancestral virus that we challenged them against. Um, but by transfer one, two, three, and four, we're seeing all of the 20 clones that we pull out of one of those experimental units we challenge it against the ancestral phage, have, are all uh, resistant. They cannot infect and create um, uh, viable uh, virus particles, okay? I'm sorry, this, this one is one day or one hour? Uh, one transfer, and transfers don't equal day. So we, 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 um, we sampled them every day, but we transferred every two days. So that, that ensures even more that sporulation, uh, uh, the spores accumulate. So two-day transfers, we sampled every day. So there's a distinction between days and transfers. And if you take E. coli, for example, in stationary phase, it's also known to be like particularly resistant to phage, and actually people yeah. are, struggle to find phages that are yeah. killing stationary phase E. coli. So would you expect that this is a property of sporulation, or could you do the, exactly the same with sort of like keeping a stationary phase culture of E. coli, then you put them together with the sort of active E. coli, and they would be the ones surviving, but sort of this is not really you don't have to go through this expensive process of exploration for that, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah great. Um, so there, there, I, I think I, I'm aware that um, like organisms that are in some kind of quiescent state that might be a little bit different than what sporulation is, uh, phages don't, aren't as productive on those on metabolically inactive hosts. I don't know, but I assume that's just a function of the host's metabolism, right? The ability of the, vi the, the, the productivity of the virus is determined to some degree by the productivity of the host. Um, the question is, uh, th what, what would be different is the mechanism of entry. So in this case, with endospores, we're not getting like actual physical binding. So if you had an E. coli cell that was starved, 
Maybe it's receptor, the, the, the expression of receptors on the surface are modified, and so in that way it would be similar, right? It's a, it's all, it might be about initial contact and infection. Or could um, you know, T4 or another E. coli virus inject its DNA, and then it's just a, a rate-limited step due to the metabolism of the host. Do, do, do you know? I, uh, no, I don't, so I would mostly say that. Yeah, that yeah. 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 Um, so in the seed bank treatment, uh, if we look in the focal population, our flasks, the, the black line looks qualitatively pretty similar. We see a steep drop off in the proportion of um, a susceptible cells. This is what we would expect uh, just based on dilution uh, over time of what the concentrate of what the, the sensitive cell types would be just due to dilution. Uh, and what we see here is what's in the seed bank. And you can see, so remember, there's some kind of protection being conferred uh, against uh, virus attack. That information can be stored in, this, in, in, in endospores, which we purify and go into the, into the spore bank. And because of that, the, at least for some of these time tips, we're seeing the preservation or maintenance of sensitive phenotypes in the population for longer. So there's some signal that, um, that phenotypic diversity is maintained through the seed bank effect. I don't understand what you I didn't explain it well. Um, so we know how many, um, it's a calculation that we're trying to basically, I'm trying to remember what the first time point is or what we're measuring here, but there are, we, we know how many sensitive, uh, the, the frequency of sensitive um, cell types are at the initial at time zero, and if we expect that those are just being transferred and there's no introduction of new individuals with uh, that sensitive phenotype, that would be the expectation if there was just dilution or exponential decay due to dilution. And what we see, the point I'm trying to make is, is that the, obs the observed gray diamond shapes are, 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 are greater than what you would expect just due to the effect of dilution based on what was in the population at the very beginning, which we had documented. So we knew the fraction of sensitive cells in the seed bank at time zero. If there were no new inputs, then you would expect that th those might just decay over time. That's the point we're, we're trying to make, to the best of my knowledge right now. I wanted to clarify one point about your experimental setup. <clears throat> when you do the experiment with the seed bank, you also do dilution, right, by the same factor or, or you know, when you do the heat treatment, you kill the cells which didn't sporulate, and then what do you do with the, with the rest? You just transfer all of it to the new flask, or you somehow dilute it? Um, there's a dilution that's made of the seed bank so that um, every time step, you would have one part old seed and four part new mm -hmm. seed bank. Mm -hmm. And then you would take a fraction of that, uh, 50 microliters of that cell suspension, and, and inoculate it into the next time step of the transfer. So in some sense, uh, all together, if you combine the fact that the, some of the bacterial cells die during the, well, during the heat treatment, the ones which did not sporulate, and this dilution, the effective dilution in your experiment with seed bank is larger than the, the, the dilution without it. I'm just trying to compare apples with apples when you do the left side panel and right side panel. The right side right. panel, not, not in this, but maybe in the previous slide, uh, the, the left panel, would you, you just do the dilution regular way because there is no, you know, there are no spores or anything. Yeah. So, yeah. and this is a dilution by factor 100, if I remember correctly, right? You, do, yeah. you take 1%. Yeah. And then on the right, you do heat treatment, which kills, I don't know how much, but let's say 50% of, and plus do this dilution of the seed bank still, right, by a factor 100. So if I just trace the, the, the life history of one bacterial cell, the chances of it to be transferred to the next generation are lower on the right than on the left. Um. I'm not sure I followed all of that, but, but I, know, I think I know where you're going. But the amount, the volume that we're putting in from the seed bank is on the order of 50 microliters. It's a relatively small volume to the volume that's being transferred over from the, from the experimental unit in the previous time step. 
but I'm not sure if that's what you're. Oh well, maybe maybe then I, I I'm I'm now confused. So you I thought you only transferred the the seeds. No. No. Oh, I see. No. Okay, that 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 that's my fault. So okay. you 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 still do the regular dilution, just like. And then yes. you add to yes. it the, the yes. seed bag. Okay, yes. yeah. okay, I didn't and catch it. That's a relatively it. small volume. Yeah. And what what happens? You, it looks like you have some sort of a stable coexistence, even though the jury is still out. Yeah. Maybe the phages yeah, are on the way out. How does it? They coexist. They coexist, but of course the resistance evolved, right? So you have the resistant. Yep. Uh, so what is the, what is the coexistence? So there is a mix of resistant and susceptible. Just on the left, uh, if, you, if I look at day 28 or something like this, so I see a coexistence between phage and the host, and yeah. it is a phage susceptible and resistant, all three coexisting together. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I should say that uh, the evolution of phage resistance is costly. Uh, you're modifying these receptors. Often those are used for transport or metabolites mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, so, so there's a cost to being resistant, and there's a cost to making a spore. Um, and what we see here, as you're, you're documenting, Sergey, is that there is yeah. coexistence. They stay, they coexist together, and both of them are undergoing this coevolutionary arms race. The, the, the take-home mm -hmm. story is that the, the, the rate and the magnitude and the intensity of coevolution is dampened by the seed bank. Okay. So we still see these processes taking place. It's just they're modified, presumably due to the external seed bank and the physical refuge of the cell not being able to be, spores being able to be infected. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, yeah, so the last thing we did, this was uh, some work we did where we, we, we did pool population sequencing. Uh, Will, who's not here, uh, helped and contributed to this. And so what we did is just measured the mutations and the host populations at the end of the experiment. This measure of gene multiplicity is basically just talking about the, the occurrences or abundances of mutations in replicate populations corrected for things like uh, a gene size because uh, larger genes have a higher probability of getting hit in a population. And so what we're looking at is a, a distribution of uh, the, the abundances of mutations uh, at the end. And so there are some mutations that are really abundant and commonly found across replicate populations. And then there's these long tails of rare mutations. Seed bank theory would, would, would predict that dormancy can retain that genetic variation that might otherwise be eliminated due to selection or random genetic drift. And these observations show that we're getting about two to two and a half times more rare mutants that are being retained in these populations when there's a seed bank versus when there's not. So, so what I've showed you is that, that, that seed banks, um, I'm going to transition, so I'm wrapping up. So they, uh, this experimental evolution approach shows that we, we, you know, we know that there's uh, a benefit of forming an endospore in terms of contact and infection rates uh, through adsorption, uh, that, that, that when we create this external seed bank, we can see modified population dynamics. We see the retention of phenotypic diversity in terms of sensitive and resistant cell types, and we're seeing uh, the, the retention of uh, rare genetic mutations in the population that otherwise would go extinct, which perhaps could be beneficial uh, in the future. Right? Can you maybe explain a bit more what exactly is being plotted here? You sort of sequence some sort of and then yeah. counted genes. I'm just trying to understand what so I'm. So you, you could start with a reference genome for delta 168, uh, and we know what all those mutations are in their ancestral state. And then at the end of this experiment, only at the end of this, we actually did sample through time, um, but we, we, we extract DNA, uh, we, we sequence those, the, the, that DNA, and we map reads back onto the reference genome. And we use a program that allows us to uh, identify insertions, deletions, and single nucleotide mutations. And so you could imagine that there might be a gene here, uh, and you can find that in multiple populations. And we can uh, assess and quantify how many times a, a, a sample that would have a gene that would have a high multiplicity score would be hit in multiple populations over time. And rare ones would be a gene where you only find a mutation occurring once. So it's a way of standardizing mutations across populations and, and, and accounting for differences in gene size. Because uh, in, in a null expectation, you would expect that larger genes should be hit more times than not. I'm just trying to understand why the, the rank stops at, at half for the minus seed bank relative to, I'm really confused. Who the, 
plus? Oh, so we're ranking the mutations based on their frequency in the population. And so on this end of the uh, this distribution, you're seeing lots of mutations that are commonly found in populations. And as you move out, these are ones that are rare. So we're finding a lot more rare mutations in the populations that have a seed bank and fewer mutations. No, but you just have twice as many mutations in the seed bank. That's know? right. But then, I mean, shouldn't you then rescale <laughs> to get the frequency distribution, the other one? And would they then look like almost exactly the same? I, I, I just don't understand no, I don't think the, so. this comparison. How can you have mm -hmm. twice as many mutations? How can you have twice as many mutations in a population? Is that, yeah. I thought you wanted to compare the frequency distribution of the mutations. Uh, these are, are the, comparing? this is the recovery of mutations in populations. And so in the seed bank, your, your observation is right, there's more mutations uh, being recovered in the seed bank about two and a half fold. And most of those are rare. And this is their abundance in the, in the population. I would really like to understand this. So you have yeah. two well, Yesterday we saw a figure where we, we saw these rank abundance distributions, which are pretty common for looking at uh, frequencies. Yeah, or, I yeah. understand what is a rank abundance distribution. Okay. I'm just trying to understand the rank abundance of what is being plotted here. So you have two populations of cells, yes. and, and then you sequence them, and you map them to the reference genome. Okay. So are you starting from two identical sized populations of cells? Sure. Are the population sizes equal? Is that what you're asking? So yeah, population sizes? Yeah, and we're standardizing by DNA concentration as well. Could it be maybe, maybe just to continue, because I'm also intrigued by this plot, but uh, could it be the fact that the uh, one without the seed bag went, went in through the bottleneck where it really dropped to you know, orders of magnitude below what it was in the beginning, and during the bottleneck, maybe some of the mutations got fixed. Uh, uh, so what, what is behind it? In other words, there were no mutator strains. Why, why you have this factor two? Do you have any, any kind of yeah, hint so, at how to understand it? So I think what we would expect, uh, independent of the methods being used here, is that if you had populations with and without a seed bank, that you have more genetic and phenotypic uh, functional information that's retained in a population that otherwise would be at risk of being lost because organisms aren't dormant and, can, and have higher rates of mortality. So in this experiment, we're transferring things. Things are getting diluted out. That would be uh, an example of, of a, bo a potential bottle. That's bottlenecking, mm -hmm. right? Yep. We see here that there's bottlenecking at around time seven, right? So yeah, so those processes of, of, of individuals being randomly lost uh, over time uh, would, would contribute to uh, selection and, and, a, and a component of drift that would lead to differences in diversity. We see that with the seed bank, you're getting more genetic diversity preserved in the population. Mutations that are arising during the experiment are not lost, either due to selection or drift, and they're being retained at about two and a half fold. And many of those mutations are rare. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the conclusion or interpretation uh, of the figure. Did, did you try to classify those mutations? Because again, the other yeah. uh, interesting possibility yeah. is that there are two types of mutations, the ones which are good for you know, being passed through the uh, seed bank channel, and the other ones which are just yeah. good through you know, evolving the phage resistance. So is it possible that this factor two and a half is due to the uh, basically two transmission channels? Each one puts a different selective pressure. Um. So what you'll see is that there are some different line uh, types, uh, and those are for the, the populations that evolved in the presence of phage and minus phage. So the, that, that general relationship is not affected by phages at all. Oh. Uh, the mutations that we do uh, find over on this right-hand side, is we have classified those, oh. and there's nothing really uh, that, that seems obvious. There's no specific uh, family of proteins or functions that seem to be retained, which again is something that we might expect if there's just random, um, uh, there's just retention of, of genetic in information uh, in the absence of selection. Okay, that's, so, that's interesting. So in other words, you would, if you were to repeat this experiment without phages at all, you would expect, to, well, you, you did, right? And you found 
the same profiles. Yeah, this is th what we're seeing here is independent of any phage effect. This is a pure seed bank effect. We don't see any statistical effect of the virus in the population on the retention of this genetic information. I see. Okay. So it, it seems to be uh, uh, solely due to the influence of the, the seed bank. So I think this is a naive question, but did you look at how um, how this kind of um, gene multiplicity rank looks at the beginning of a transfer, or like early on after a transfer and then late after a transfer? So kind of how does it change over the time of a transfer? Yeah, I mean, so this question about bottlenecking would, would, would beg that question. Uh, we didn't, uh, we didn't choose to sample at that uh, frequency resolution to address that question. But yeah, you might imagine that, um, yeah, you could look at this for each, at the end of each transfer, um, yeah. And I guess my expectation would be is that the, initially, early on in the experiment, maybe the, the retention of diversity in the seed bank would be minimal and you would see this effect um, grow over time, would be a, off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, yeah. Reset it. I see. And how quickly does this set up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, can I ask you uh, the last question? Yeah. Um, no, I was trying to understand, where does the seed bank come from in terms of how do you generate the seed bank population? To in this experiment? It? Yeah. Um, through, uh, first, step one, by having a, a strain that can produce endospores. But that's not enough. The second thing is to create this external seed bank where we um, preserve and, and um, purify endospores and put them in the external seed bank. And do you do it while the experiment is running? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So basically, you have a yeah. population that is uh, growing and producing endospores. Yeah. So does the seed bank reflect, so the, the diversity of the seed bank reflect the diversity of that population? Yes. Yeah, there's a seed bank for each replicate population. It's not a, a, a global seed bank across experimental units. And I think there's a lot that could be done with this by expanding the, the, the ratios and the amount of time. You could imagine you could purify a uh, seed bank from different environments uh, and, and have migration between uh, seed banks. Um, OK, so um, yeah, maybe it's like 10 minutes that we have. Is that right? Um, I've got two things to talk about, and I don't think we can get through two of them. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to give you a preview on, on this work, which is actually not quite uh, baked yet. Um, um, it's some work that we did. Um, and, and so the general question is, 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 can dormancy prevent the spread of viruses? And, and this is kind of um, the way we're setting this up is this is sort of a spatial question. Uh, in the previous experiment, we have well-mixed flasks where Phage particles are coming into contact freely in a well-mixed system. Uh, but there are many cases where uh, viruses are kind of isolated in, in local populations and patches. Um, and so what motivated this were a couple papers that came out uh, over the past four or five years. Uh, the first one is from Joshua Weitz, who's collaborating on all this work. They have been studying uh, sulfur lobus. Um, uh, and what they, this is an Archean, and what they found is that they could deactivate phage particles with UV radiation, and if they came into contact with the host, just the physical contact would initiate dormancy in this, in this population. So just purely physical contact was enough to allow Sulfolobus Icelandicus to enter a dormant state. Uh, there's been some other work in um, uh, Listeria uh, and in CRISPR-Cas out of the MISCA group in Washington showing that um, CRISPR can be used to downregulate RNA in the entire um, uh, cell, but it also kills off virus infections. And so through this way, this mechanism of CRISPR-induced dormancy, you can actually prevent phage infections from sp spreading in populations. So these types of papers were coming out. Uh, they were interesting to us. And the thing that we're going to focus on here are, um, are the size of plaques that form on a lawn. And this is a pretty... Uh, people have been doing this for hundreds of years. We can use this to enumerate the, num the number of uh, phage particles in a population, but the morphology, the shape, the size of those, uh, those clearings on a lawn of susceptible hosts uh, may also con uh, convey some information that can be uh, of value. Um, I want to get through the last thing, but I just want to kind of show that one of the things we did is we infected hosts that could sporulate 
and those that couldn't. So a wild type strain that can form endospores, plate them out on a lawn, put down infectious phage particles and characterize the plaque size. We did the same thing for a host where there had been a, a mutation in SPO2E, uh, which is an essential gene that's involved in sporulation. And when we did this, you can see that the, uh, the plaques that form on the wild type are about two, two and a half times smaller than the plaques that result when you plate them on a lawn of the bacterium that cannot form endospores. So that was sort of interesting. It suggests that uh, dormancy might be uh, preventing the, the spatial spread of, of, of viruses in these structured petri dishes. So that's macro scale observation one. Um, I'm unfamiliar with this assay, but like what, in the absence of sporulation, what limits the, the spread of the plaque? What is sort of like, what determines the, its limits? Or? I don't know. Okay. That's, that's a really interesting question. What, 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 what determines the size of a plaque? I mean, that was sort of the question that, that's a general question. Uh, usually I think it's resource depletion of the, the, the host, right? And so the, just what we were talking about, as the lawn grows and it gets really dense, and the virus is moving, there's resource depletion around the perimeter, and uh, there's not enough energy for the host to sustain reproduction of the virus part. That would be a, a resource-based explanation for what ultimately limits the size of a plaque from taking over the entire plate. This uh, is two times the same phage, right? Uh, did you say it's the same phage? On the left and right, yes. Uh, same phage, yeah. Yes, yeah. but it's two different bacteria derived from the same wild type strain. So we have uh, the wild type or Delta uh, 168 and we have uh, a, a single gene mutation in SPO2E. Uh, it's just the same bacterial population that we used in the previous experiment. So could it be that the, just the density of the lawn is different on the left and right? Um, we don't see any fitness consequences associated, at least in liquid. And I mean, by eye you can see the lawns form. So I don't, that wouldn't be what, what I would, would first suspect. So we see some differences in cell size. The other thing, so this is the macro scale observation. There's a micro scale observation. We grew, uh, we made little mini plaques on auger plates and looked at them underneath the microscope. And there was a micro scale phenomenon that stuck out to us that initially seemed really uh, interesting and could potentially explain why the plaques don't get bigger. Um, you can see in the bright field on the left that there's this zone of clearing here. And there's cells on the lawn around it. And we had a, uh, the one strain that we were able to use is a GFP reporter, uh, which is uh, fused to uh, COT-Z, which is a protein that's involved in the uh, endospore uh, uh, protein, proteinaceous uh, component of the, of the spore. And what you can see is that there are a lot of mature spores forming a ring, a rampart or a wall that you might imagine physically could prevent the, the, the mu movement and diffusion of virus particles in these environments. So my first reaction was like, oh, that's really cool. Uh, we also have to start to think about, well, why would that ring form? Um, and on the right panel, what you're seeing is a, um, a distance profile, if you will, where we measured the amount of GFP expression from the center at zero of the, of the plaque and outwards. And so you can see this big ring of, of GFP. Um, there's still we're still seeing spores being produced elsewhere on the plate, presumably just due to pure resource depletion, um, but, but the, those concentrations go down. So there seems to be, at the, at the leading front of a plaque, you're seeing enrichment of spores. The question is, how, how, how and why might that happen? Uh, I'm sorry, maybe they could lost. What is in the center? Clearing. That there's no cells. Um, so in this bright field, you can see that there's cells out here no cells in the middle because they've been killed by the viruses. Um, here, you see preferential enrichment of endospores around the perimeter of the, of the plaque clearing. And here, you can still see that there are endospores out in this region being produced, but not to the same density as here. Wouldn't it be sort of expected if indeed the boundary of the ring is due to starvation and um, if, if the B satellite runs out of resources, we know that it forms spores. So could it be just a byproduct of the fact that the ring stopped where it did because 
bacteria ran out of nutrients. Yeah, so your, your one hypothesis could be is that there's just more resource depletion at this point. Yeah. Okay, we, we explored this. I'm not gonna have a chance to go throughout all these, but that's one hypothesis. Another one is this contact mediated. Do, do virus particles uh, accelerate or initiate the, the, the process of sporulation? Uh, and then the, the last hypothesis, and I'm gonna try to move this along so we don't, is we, we create, we use some uh, partial differential equations to kind of to model this and come up with some predictions. We can easily get the macro scale differences in plaque size. That's not hard to do. The thing that's a little bit more challenging is to get this ring. And the thing that we needed to do to get the ring was include a, uh, uh, a diffusible metabolite, a danger signal, if you will. Something that uh, cells uh, here, so if there's lysis occurring here, you can imagine that there's some kind of diffusible compound, we don't know what it could be, that accelerates the onset of, of sporulation. That's the working hypothesis. The models need that. We don't have any uh, experimental evidence, we're working on it to, to back that up, but there must be some kind of uh, chemical, it could be something like a lysate, it could be peptidoglycan, which is known to, to be a signaling molecule, um, we, we don't know yet. So Jay, I think this is really cool, this, this reminds me a lot of, of hypersensitive response in plants, have you heard of this concept? Explain it, yeah. I think basically when uh, on a plant leaf, you know, there's a, um, I guess maybe a fungal pathogen that hits yeah. the plant at some point that, you know, you will see a ring of dead cells, basically programmed uh, cell death yeah. to contain this. Okay. this um, yeah, yeah. Sort of as a, a, a type one immune response for the plant or is it more of an ad adaptive immunity? It's no, I guess, yeah, I guess this is a very general immunity, yeah. Right. yeah. You would, you would uh, see, in this case, you know, for example, the viral particle, and you'd be like, oh, this is a signal to, to shut down, so to yeah. contain this. Um, so maybe you can find inspiration in, in Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I, I don't, I don't want to, um, I think I gave away the punchline. We, we, we created some models. We needed to update those models, and we needed to include this diffusible metabolite in order to get the... Uh, effects that we see here where we can recreate plaque size variation and this ring structure. Still a work in progress, and I think uh, these experiments beg that we, we, we uh, think a little bit more about uh, the chemistry that might be involved in these danger signals and the mechanisms of, of um, what's leading to that protective, putatively protective ring. Um, I just want to end really quickly uh, on the last side of things. So one of the things we know about studying viruses and other systems is uh, in the context of coevolution, uh, parasites usually find ways to get around the defense mechanisms of the host. And, uh, and this is true in, in, in the case here as well. Uh, you would think that maybe creating an endospore that has no receptors that a virus could potentially recognize and has no way of getting inside of a cell that is uh, biologically and energetically inert would be uh, a dead end for the virus. Uh, but it seems that there are ways in which they've co-opted dormancy to their advantage. Um, the first sort of not entirely chronological way in which we approach this was thinking about um, documenting the existence of auxiliary genes. So some of you may know that viruses have pretty streamlined genomes. Most of their gene content is made for infecting cells, taking over host machinery, and the assembly of new virus particles and releasing them into the environment. Very small genomes. But if you go out here and you were to look at viruses in the ocean, uh, you will find that they contain uh, metabolism genes, phosphorus genes, nitrogen genes, fermentation genes, uh, ammonia oxidation genes, sulfur metabolism genes. These are referred to as auxiliary metabolic genes. Um, and in some cases, people have been able to show or infer through um, transcriptomics and such that, that this may be advantageous to the virus. By, by using those genes and during an infection, a host can uh, allocate more energy to reproduction and you will get more viral infections. This is the idea. Uh, this led us to ask the question, okay, there are a lot of viral genomes available to us now, uh, and we know what the list of 500 sporulation genes that could be potentially um, obtained uh, by viruses. And perhaps they could use those in ways that would modify the decision-making behavior of an endospore-forming cell. Um, and so we had, uh, uh, we collaborated with Kelly Wrighton at, uh, at Colorado State University, who does a lot of work, she had a lot of data uh, on viral metal genomes from various different ecosystems. And so what I'm showing here is a list of uh, some sporulation genes, essential sporulation genes on the x-axis. And we have a heat map here showing the recovery of uh, sporulation homologs from uh, 
metagenomically assembled virus meta, uh, genomes in different ecosystems. We focused mostly on the human gut and found that there were a lot of sporulation genes that were inside of genomes. Um, and, and that was an interesting pattern. Um, um, so then, the last slide I want to show is I did some work with um, uh, Daniel Schwartz, who's now moved on and is working in the Netherlands. And we looked in actual culture collections of viruses. And we knew what their genomes were. And we found another one that had um, transcription factors, or what are called sigma factors, that are involved specifically in the formation of endospores. So we had an isolate with a sporulation homolog that had presumably been obtained through horizontal means. Um, some of those were very, very closely related to sporulation genes in Bacillus subtilis. And so what we did, the first step was to, uh, to use CRISPR-Cas editing to remove those, uh, those sporulation homologs from the virus and see if they were essential or not. If it's an auxiliary gene, you should be able to delete it and it should have no effect on the ability of that virus to infect its host. And that's what we found. So then we took, there's some limitations to what you can do in the system. We took that sporulation gene that was inside a virus, we cut it out with CRISPR and we inserted it into bacillus and we ectopically expressed that protein inside of the host cell. We saw that when we expressed that gene, it led to um, changes preferentially in genes that are involved in transcripts and sporulation pathway. And in this case over here, you can see that it disrupts the ability of the host to uh, form endospores by 99%. Um, so it, this, this is favoring the reproductive uh, fitness component of the virus by preventing it from entering that refuge. Uh, you could also imagine that perhaps different types of genes might uh, increase the probability of those cells uh, going, forming an endospore. And if viruses can get in and form virospores, then that would um, perhaps be beneficial in terms of its survivorship component of fitness. Um, so the full story is that uh, we got into this really super naively. Uh, it's like, yeah, this cell type probably can't get infected as much. And we've shown through experimental coevolutionary means that um, that's true. It affects population dynamics, the retention of phenotypic diversity and genotypic diversity. Uh, we've been able to kind of ask some questions about how and to what degree sporulation may prevent the spread of viruses in spatially structured populations, and that maybe we need to think a little bit more about uh, metabolites and things that are diffusing in this environment, whether they're actively produced or if this is something that's just in a lysate of a dead cell. And uh, finally, we, we we're seeing some evidence using metagenomics that um, viruses have the ability to tap in, co-opt, hijack, and, and perhaps um, continue this co-evolutionary arms race. Uh, via means that manipulate the transition probabilities of, of cells into and out of dormancy. Um, yeah, so uh, only th three minutes late. <laughs> there you go. Okay, thanks. There is, there is time for one or two quick questions. Going back to the gene rank abundance graph, did you look by any chance what these rare mutations are? Yeah, we did. And we thought there might be some kind of unique uh, functional signature associated with them. And there's really, it seems like there, there, it's, it's, there's nothing special going on with those genes. Um, and so, it, you know, it suggests that, yeah, maybe you're just retaining neutral variation in certain genes in the population. So, so there's nothing that really distinguishes those genes from the common mutations that we saw in the population. But they are different. And another one was, I was thinking about uh, the sporulation, uh, the other graph you showed. And it, would there be any chance um, of cyclic AMP in uh, DICT when yeah. they start forming spores? Yeah. There's cyclic AMP waves going on, um, and it's a key factor in spore forming in DICT. So you're talking about the plaques, or no? When, when they, there's no food and they, they start to starve, there's cyclic AMP going on, so they form spores um, in order to survive starvation. OK, I just want to make sure I understand what figure you're talking about. This is early on? In the it's the, about the phage. Um, like, I think it's one previously. Uh, yeah. That, that's the one. This one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, is could cyclic AMP specifically be, 
I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I don't tend to think about, uh, I mean, I, this is how science works, right? You see a pattern and you got to try to figure out what's going on. So I've been trying to think broadly about what could be going on. Um, I have a little bit of, uh, I've thought a little bit about peptidoglycan and how those, I mean, those are like PAMP molecules, right, that induce inflammatory responses. So there's really good evidence that things like um, LPS or uh, uh, peptidoglycan can serve as signaling molecules, maybe cyclic AMP. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know, and I'd be, I'd be happy if anyone had some suggestions. And then the question is, like, how do you go about, uh, you know, once you identify a potential chemical candidate that could be a danger signal, how do you go about studying that? I think the first thing for us right now, we're working on some experiments in the lab where we can take whole cell lysates generated by, by virus infections and seeing whether or not we can um, increase the kinetic onset of, of sporulation. Can, can we, because if that, if you could do that just at an aggregate level without identifying even what the chemical is, you could say that there's something in the lysates that is, is accelerating sporulation and that would uh, be one explanation for the ring formation. Because you can see that there are cells on the outside that are undergoing sporulation, right? So the conditions are suitable for spore formation, it's just that there's higher densities, which would suggest that maybe they can enter dormancy earlier due to the processing of, of signals in the environment. One more questions? So if there are not, let's thank you again. Thank you.